Welcome. I'm Paul Merkley, co-founder of Seniors Junction, a company that offers courses in music appreciation and related arts at a university level delivered in a way that is accessible to seniors. It's a pleasure and an honor to be the table setter for today's performance of Chimarosa's lovely opera, Il Matrimonio Segreto. I think it's a fitting choice for the 11th season of Opera Ottawa, saluting you for picking it and preparing it. I'm going to go right to share screen and introduce you to a few points that I hope you'll find interesting and helpful. So, our composer, Domenico Cimarosa, the title of the opera is Il Matrimonio Segreto, The Secret Marriage. The libretto is by Giovanni Bertatti, and I'll be telling you a few things about him. It's based on an English play called The Clandestine Marriage. The premiere of this opera took place in Vienna in 1792. Vienna was the most important court in Europe, therefore the place where you wanted your opera to be performed, if possible. And it was a very, very successful per performance. So much so, the emperor liked it so much that after the public performance, he immediately said, I want this very evening you to perform it again in my chambers. So that gives you some idea. Looking at the dates of Chimarosa, um, we would say very close to Mozart's dates. Mozart born in 1756, died in 1791. So think of him being active about the same time as Mozart. He was born in a little town near Naples. That is where he was taught. And that is where he first worked as a musician. It was a great environment for a musician. Lots of music going on, plenty of people teaching, plenty of people performing, especially opera was an important activity. And it was, um, there was almost a routine that had been developed that a composer could have the services of a libretto for something between one and two months. And then they had to finish their work. And then there was a time allotted for rehearsal. And then the performance came. So it was all done in a very efficient way. I suppose today we would say an accelerated way. Now, he was a violinist, a keyboardist, and a singer. And I say keyboardist because at the time, that would have meant piano, harpsichord, and organ, depending on what was available and what was needed. He composed a great many comic operas and shorter stage productions that we call musical farces. I would say that his farces in particular, but also the operas, were influenced by the, the Italian tradition that was called the Commedia dell'arte. That's the tradition in which there are the characters Pierrot and Columbine that chase each other around in a, in a humorous love triangle. There's always that. Pierrot is always holding the rose out to Columbine. She's always looking in another direction. <laughs> and other characters come in too. So this kind of stock comedy really was at the heart of this Neapolitan style of comedy. Goethe, you may or may not know, wrote a book about a long trip he took through Italy, uh, the Italian trip, the Italianische Reise, and he wrote in it that in 1787, he was very impressed by an opera written by Cimarosa that he heard. So imagine a young man growing up in Naples, going to school there, recognized as a talented musician, rapidly becoming a member of a composition class, and then taking on bigger and bigger jobs, 
with the idea of having his works performed in more and more important places. Here's an engraving of the composer that I like very much because I think it tells us a lot. First of all, he's standing. So our first impression is the painter, the engraver wants to show us that he's under time pressure, he's in a hurry, he has to produce quickly. He's got one piece of music sitting at the keyboard, one in his hand, and he's copying something right now maybe it's a part that he's copying from the score hard to be sure but certainly the keyboard saying this man was a very busy composer and i believe it must have been true because we credit 60 six zero stage works to him that's farces and operas together uh, for for his working time for the time that he was active as an opera composer, that's more than two a year. That's a very fast pace of production. Again, that's partly related to the working rhythm in Naples, the traditions in which they produced opera, but it says something about the composer himself. If you look at the keyboard in this engraving, you'll see from the thickness of the legs and the sturdiness and the setup, that it is a forte piano, which is kind of interesting. Again, that's Mozart's preferred instrument and probably Cimarosa's preferred instrument. He would have played the clavichord or the harpsichord or the organ when necessary, but for most purposes, it would have been the forte piano. Got one quill that he's writing with and one quill is sitting at the ready so that if he gets the first quill too dull, or if he if he splits it and therefore it can't make proper musical notes, he's going to grab the next quill and keep going. A nice engraving. All right. So the idea then of your career as a composer of operas was to move to bigger and bigger opera houses. And in Italy, the the summit was La Scala in Milan, just as it is today. That's the best place to have your opera performed. That happened for him for the first time in 1780. In 1782, he was appointed to a very important position, the maestro of the conservatory of the school for orphans in Venice. And you may remember that that was a post that Vivaldi also held. In 1785, the King of Naples made him the second organist in the Royal Chapel, which gave him a salary whether he was present or absent. So it left him free to go to other cities to supervise performances or work for other patrons. An important position. Now, outside of Italy, uh, the idea was if possible, to get a, an appointment at the court of Vienna because the, the Emperor of Austria had the most important court in Europe. So the Imperial composer had the best job of any musician. After that, there were courts that were slightly of slightly less importance and then it all went down to cities like Milan. So in 1787, he obtained an appointment as the chapel master in the court of Catherine II in St. Petersburg. Now the Russian Imperial Court was very, very important, very prestigious, and I'm sure he was very excited to get the position. As he traveled there, he went through Vienna to meet the, the emperor of Austria and of course, with the hope eventually of getting the appointment as the imperial composer there. Actually, the emperor favored that idea, but he'd already signed a contract with St. Petersburg, so he had to fulfill that first. Nevertheless, it was planned 
in the Imperial Court in Vienna that he would succeed in that position when his work in St. Petersburg was finished. So it was finished in 1791. And in 1792, just after the death of Mozart, Il Matrimonio Segreto was performed in Vienna. Now, I want to follow another line to look at the librettist for a minute. Bertati was a little bit older than Cimarosa. He's known as a librettist of comic operas. He has two serious operas, but they were at the beginning of his career. Mostly, he succeeded as a poet of comic operas. He visited Vienna several times because he wanted to become the imperial librettist there. Now, his main competition was Lorenzo da Ponte, and da Ponte was Mozart's librettist. And da Ponte was always seeming to get in one kind of trouble or another or insulting the wrong person. And there was a lot of competition for this poetic position because, again, it was the best in the empire, the best in Europe. So in 1791, for an accumulation of offenses, the emperor dismissed Lorenzo da Ponte and he appointed Cimarosa as his librettist, as it turns out, just in time for the opera you're going to hear in a couple of minutes. So this is how things come together and, and how they work. There was an experienced, ambitious librettist at the same time as Cimarosa was arriving, wanting to make his mark as a composer. So we get a, a successful piece out of it. A word or two about the environment in Vienna among the poets. Actually, the same is true about the musicians, but I have a better demonstration for the librettists. They all tried to discredit each other because they wanted to get you out of the job and them into it, right? If I could get you fired from the position, then maybe I could get the position for myself. So uh, yes, <laughs> Bertati wrote a nasty little poem about da Ponte and spread it all around Vienna, trying to discredit him. I'm going to read it in Italian and English because it's fun. As you know, Necesti, you were born an ass. And as you know, Morai, and you will die an ass. Ora di si poco. Now I'm, I've said just a little. Col tempo duro assai. In time, I will say a lot. So these words went flying around Vienna and everybody knew they were referring to da Ponte. He considered it just part of the competition of the city. He even quoted this little verse in his autobiography, which is where I read it first. Hmm. All right, you're going to hear a wonderful opera. There are comparisons to be made between Mozart's style and Cimarosa's style. And in particular, if you've heard Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro, you may hear similarities of style. Question and answer, writing. Perhaps most tellingly, there are many compositions for ensembles. And the count is that there are eight solo arias but four duets, three trios, a quartet, a quintet, and two ensemble finales. What do you say? What do I mean by an ensemble finale? Let me take a minute. In the Baroque, the coming and going on the stage was arranged such that at the beginning of an act, all the characters were on the stage. And then for one reason or another in the plot, character by character, one or two at a time, they left the stage leaving at the end of a of half an act, let's say, uh, one singer only standing there to sing a solo aria, a very, usually a very tragic one, which was called an exit aria because then the, the singer exited 
and people would throw flowers and money and whatever you could imagine. So if you were a singer and a, a famous one, you wrote into your contract that if you would sing in this opera house, you were guaranteed a certain number of exit arias because that is how you made money. That's the Baroque. Now, Mozart's way of doing this is the opposite. An act begins with just one character, then we add another character, more come on, and then maybe halfway through the act, we have a number in which all the characters are on stage and they all sing a big finale together. That's the ensemble finale. It's very well suited to comic operas. Now, Mozart's operatic genius for me is consists of two things. One, that he painted characters in music very well. I sang Leporello in Don Giovanni. Uh, he always made Leporello sound like a bumbling, cowardly servant. My music always said that. I probably only sang two or three notes at a time, indicating that I was not that sophisticated as a character. But the second thing about Mozart's writing for opera characters is that when there are ensembles, the whole ensemble gels together, goes together very well, fits together well musically, and each character retains his or her musical identity. That's to me the genius of Mozart's writings. You won't find that much in this opera, but you will find some very, very expressive writing. And I would in particular draw your attention to the beautiful opening duet, Para Non Dubitar. Well, thank you for paying close attention. I'd just like to mention that Again, I'm here for Seniors Junction, and we give music appreciation and related arts classes to seniors in a substantial way and in an accessible way. If there's a senior in your life that you love, well, check us out. Um, subscribe to our newsletter. See what we have on offer on our site. Thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the opera.